اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ربی شرح لی صدری و یسر لی عمری وحل لقطت من لسانی یفقہو قولی وی سٹارٹ ود ورس 272 of Surah Al-Baqarah. O Prophet, you are not responsible for their guidance. It is Allah who guides whom he pleases. Whatever wealth you spend in charity, it is to your own advantage, provided you give to seek the pleasure of Allah. Whatever wealth you spend for the sake of Allah will be paid back to you in full and you will not be wronged. Now the verse says, O Prophet وسلم, you are not responsible for their guidance. It is Allah who guides whom he pleases. Now this uh, phrase, this sentence has a background and the background of this particular verse is that the Muslims did not uh, consider it right to give sadaqah to their non-Muslim relatives. They also wanted that their non-Muslim relatives should become Muslims and Allah tells them that guidance is only in Allah's hands and that you shall spend on your non-Muslim relatives because doing sila raham with them carries reward and you will get your due reward of spending by spending on them as well. However, zakat can only be given to the Muslims. You cannot give zakat to a non-Muslim because the zakat is the right of a Muslim. But the nafal charity uh, or sadaqat can be given to non-Muslims and the reward of giving uh, to them is no less. And this point is emphasized in the second part of the verse where it says, whatever wealth you spend in charity, it is to your own advantage provided that you give to seek the pleasure of Allah. Now, whatever wealth you spend for the sake of Allah will be paid back to you in full and you will not be wronged. So this point has been uh, made clear in their minds that don't have this botheration in your mind that if we give charity to a non-Muslim, it will carry no reward at all. Verse 273, charity is for those needy people who are engaged so much in the cause of Allah that they cannot move about in the land to earn their livelihood. The ignorant think that they are wealthy on account of their modest behavior. You can recognize them by their look because they do not make instant demands on people. Whatever you spend on them, surely Allah knows it. Now the verse says, that the charity is for those needy people who are engaged so much in the cause of Allah that they cannot move about in the land to earn livelihood. In this verse, we are shown another place to give our charity, that the people who are by any way serving Allah's deen, may it be gaining religious education or giving religious education or jihad or tabligh and the person is so engrossed in it that he has no time to earn money for himself. So it is a very profitable place to give your charity here. And the word al-fuqara means the needy, those who need support for their physical sustenance and it covers all those who cannot engage themselves in other jobs because of their religious preoccupations. The verse then says that the ignorant think that they are wealthy on account of their modest behavior. Now this means that these people do not disclose their needs to people. They do not go about asking people or telling people that, you know, I haven't... Uh, eaten since yesterday or I don't have money for this or that need of mine. And these people are people who are studying or teaching Allah's deen. So obviously it is uh, below their dignity to ask someone. They will 
beg only before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they carry a contentment in their attitude or in their behavior and so the ignorant people or the people who do not have a sensitive heart cannot make out and they consider them to be well-to-do people like them whereas in reality they are the ones who cannot make both ends meet and they are what we call in our language safed poch so it is much better to give them than to give to professional beggars and the worst then says that you can recognize them by their look because they do not make instant demands on people this means that if you have a sensitive heart you have an open eye you can recognize them because the first indication is they do not ask anyone but poverty bears its marks and reflects uh, from the conditions prevailing in their house and these things are felt rather than being told verse 274 the verse says those who spend their wealth in charity by night and day secretly and openly they will have their reward from their rub they shall have nothing to fear or to regret now the excellence of those who spend in the way of allah is stressed they are those people who are not affected by the time or the place whether it is day or it is night it is morning or evening whenever they get a chance to do sadaqa they do not wait for another time to come and similarly whether they are alone or in public they are not affected because their real aim and objective is to please allah subhanahu wa taala and actually this is the principle that is as the occasion demands because sometimes it happens that you come to know that sadaqa should be given to someone and there are people around so you start thinking to yourself that if i give now i may be doing show off or uh, i may be doing riya and that also is a trick of shaitan to stop us at that time and maybe once that opportunity goes there may never be a chance for you to do it again so you should not wait for privacy and then give away the sadaqa now based on the authority of ibn asakir there is a report that this verse was revealed for hazrat abu bakr siddiq who once spent 40000 dinars in the way of allah making it 10000 during the day 10000 during the night 10000 openly and 10000 secretly verse 275 those who live on usury will not rise up before allah except like those who are driven to madness by the touch of shaitan that is because they claim trading is no different than usury but allah has made trading lawful and usury unlawful he who has received the admonition from his rab and has mended his way may keep his previous gains allah will be his judge those who turn back they shall be the inmates of hellfire wherein they will live forever now from this verse begins the verses of the forbiddance of riba and the injunctions related to its unlawfulness now this issue is a very important issue from all angles on one hand there are the severe warnings of the quran and sunna and on the other hand it has been um, uh, taken today as an integral part of the world economy the verse starts by saying that those who live on usury will not rise up before allah except like those who are driven to madness by the touch of shaitan according to a definition done by hazrat ali razi allah taala anhu that any profit taken on loan is interest or riba whether the loan is taken for personal use for example a person needs money for his treatment or for his business purposes and the return of the money is with the condition of an increase in the actual amount uh, 
Now Allah says that these people will rise up from their graves like a person who is in a fit of madness by the touch of shaitan. Why? Because your spiritual state in dunya will be your physical state in the akhirah. And the first thing we find from this sentence is that a human being can go mad under the influence of jinns and shaitans and the observations of those who have had such experiences they literally prove it hafiz ibn qayyim rahimullah has confirmed that physicians and philosophers have conceded that epilepsy fainting or madness are caused by several kinds of reasons and one of which at times could also be the input of jinns and shaitans and the second point is that the consumer of riba is mad with his lust for money if any one of you has had a chance to observe a mad person have you ever seen you will find that they have obsession of something they are so protective about these things and they do not bear to part with them similarly a person who com- consumes riba is obsessed with this money and he you know dare not part with it and just as a mad person is insensitive to other people for example you tell a person about your problems he will laugh over it because he cannot sense your problems he, his mind does not have that ability to sense your problems similarly the consumer of interest does not feel the pain of the person who has taken loan whether he is sick or he is bankrupted the consumer of interest does not care a hoot about it he wants his money back along with the due interest and the warning of punishment do not affect him in the least he is so drunk with his greed that he is neither kind to anyone poor nor does he blush before anyone for what he does since he was senseless during his lifetime in the world he was raised on the day of resurrection in that same condition and the worst then says that is because they claim trading is no different than usury but allah has made trading lawful and usury unlawful now in this sentence the reason for this punishment is given number 1 that they consumed haram by dealing in riba and number 2 they try to prove it lawful in reply to those who declare it haram and their argument is that riba is you know just like trading just as profit is derived from riba profit is derived from trading and if riba is prohibited trading should also be prohibited this is their argument and if trade is halal then riba should be made halal too praise be to allah subhanahu wa taala that he did not answer their rational doubt by a parallel rational argument rather on the contrary answering in his wisdom he said that allah almighty is the absolute sovereign master of all and he alone knows the harm and benefit the good and bad of everything most comprehensively when he declares something to be halal and something else to be haram you should immediately realize that there must be some loss or harm or evil in that which has been declared haram even if one does not see through it this is because the actual reality of this whole system and the benefit and harm that lies therein can only be encompassed by the same alim the knower and the khabir the aware from whose reach of knowledge the minutest particle of the world cannot escape the worst then says that he who has received the admonition of his rab and had mended his way may keep his previous gains allah will be his judge here it means that a person who has collected some money before riba was declared haram and who repented after riba was declared haram and promised himself that he would never go near it in future may keep his previous gains now remains the inward affair that his tauba is sincere and heartfelt 
or is his toba just a hypocritical repentance that is a matter both these situations whether it is sincere or it is hypocritical this is a matter between him and his rab and his rab will decide whether to forgive him or not we find that the prohibition of riba came gradually uh, like the prohibition of wine and the last and the final injunction came during the last period of the revelation of the quran it was exactly 4 months before the death of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but we find that these verses are so intense that one literally shudders on hearing them the prohibition of interest has come in seven verses and 40 ahadith but yet if a person chooses to keep on his previous ways taking simply no heed from these warnings then allah says that the destination of such people is hell and even in hell there are two categories of people number 1 who will be taken out after bearing the punishment of their sin and number 2 those who will never be taken out and will stay there forever for forever and the people who persist in riba they fall in the second category verse 276 Allah has laid his curse on usury and blessed charity to prosper. Allah does not love any ungrateful sinner. Now in this verse we are told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eradicates riba and lets sadaqa grow. Here we see that the contradiction between riba and charity are made clear. They have been introduced and we can note that there is a contradiction in the very nature of riba and sadaqa their outcome is different their objectives are different their intentions are different and the contradiction in their nature is that in sadaqa one gives to others what belongs to him without any reward or return from that person while in riba that which belongs to others is taken without any compensation or return then the intention is different because the one who gives sadaqa seeks nothing but the pleasure of allah and for earning a merit in the hereafter whereas the taker of riba is eager to collect unlawful increase on the capital he already has and the third thing that the outcome of both are different as it is made clear in this verse that allah erases the gains obtained through riba and takes away its baraka and increases the wealth or the baraka for the giver of sadaqa now some commentators have said that this erasing and increasing relates to the hereafter where the riba consumer will find his wealth of no use it might as well become a curse for him while those who are engaged in acts of sadaqa and khairat will find that their wealth has become a source of eternal blessing and this is obvious in which there is no doubt however according to the consensus of commentators the position is that the erasing of riba and increasing of sadaqa is most certainly related to the hereafter but some of its traces are observed in the world as well in this dunya as well the money or property of which riba becomes a part is sometimes destroyed taking with it all that was before it and this is a common sight in markets of riba and stocks where millionaires and capitalists of yesterday become penniless no doubt there are chances of profit and loss in riba free business and activities and there are many businessmen who face losses in business deals but a loss that turns a millionaire into a beggar is witnessed only in the riba markets and stock exchanges there are so many statements of experienced businessmen which say that the wealth collected through riba may increase higher and faster but generally it does not survive uh, long enough to uh, run through 
children and their successors. In between comes some calamity or the other. And Hazrat Ma'mar said that they, they have heard from their elders that 40 years hardly passed on the riba consumer when a major loss overcomes his wealth. Maybe the wealth or the property does not go to the uh, it does not show that it is going to ruins outwardly, but this much is quite certain that it benefits and um, its uh, blessings will go away. Perhaps at this point, someone may doubt keeping in view the comfort and status enjoyed by the riba consumers of today. Here, uh, they are with their mansions and villas and living in every luxury money can buy, attended by servants and maids, having the best to eat, best to drink and to sleep and necessities and absurdities all rolled up into one. But a sane person can differentiate that there is a huge difference between the articles of comfort and the comfort itself. The articles of comfort can be bought, but the actual comfort, which is peace and bliss, is neither made in any factory or sold in any market. This is Rahma, which comes directly, directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are occasions when this cannot be produced, no matter how much one holds in his possessions. Just think of the comfort of a sound sleep. In order to have it, we can certainly do our best, make a sleep-oriented house, which is the best possible. Prefer, uh, a, you know, a very perfect kind of arrangement of air and light and cooling and heating and handsome-looking furniture, the bed, the mattress, the pillows, all chosen ideally. But can we be sure that sleep will come just because all these things are there? If you have never personally experienced this, there are a thousands who cannot sleep due to some disease. Reports from a country so wealthy and civilized as the USA revealed that 70% people cannot sleep without sleeping pills. There are times when even these do not work. You can buy from stores things to make you sleep, but you cannot buy sleep actually from any sleep store at any price. Similar is the case of other articles of comfort and enjoyment. You can buy these articles against money, but it is not necessary that you do experience comfort and enjoyment. Again, after having understood this, if we look closely at what happens to consumers of riba, we shall find that they have everything in the world except what we know as the real peace of mind and the real comfort. So intoxicated they are in turning their 10 million into 15 and 15 into 20 that they have no time to eat or dress up or be with their wives and spend time with their children. There are factories to take care of. There are foreign ships to watch. Anxieties after anxieties chase them day in and day out. With them they sleep and with them they rise. They, these, these kind of crazy people have confused comfort with the articles of comfort. Though these two are two separate things and as for the status and prestige, the fact is that such people become hard-hearted and merciless, taking advantage of the poverty of the poor and the low income of the low income people becomes their very occupation. Like parasites, they suck their blood to feed their own bodies and since that is that, it is just not possible that people will ever respect them. And look at the money. The, uh, the money lenders of India or the Jews of Syria, they are rolling in money, yet they are given no respect in any group of human beings. In any corner of the world, they are not respected. 
and set against this is the case of those who give sadaka and khairat you will never find them running after money so anxiously they may have lesser articles of comfort but they shall be found having more satisfaction and peace of the heart which is actually the real comfort and consequently they shall be looked at with respect and admiration by every human being of the world and the people they have helped will give them sincere duas which is one of the greatest blessing one can get you cannot buy duas but they get these duas so we see that the worse it says that allah destroys riba and nourishes charity applies in dunya as well the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no matter how much riba increases it will decrease ultimately and this is the Mus- this hadith is from the musnad of ahmad and ibn majah the end of the verse says that allah does not like any disbeliever any sinner now here it is indicated that those who do not hold riba as haram have fallen into kufr these are the people who deny that riba is haram and those who accept it to be haram yet they are involved in haram these kind of people are sinners and transgressors what we call fasik but they do not enter the fold of kufr and another meaning of kufr is ungratefulness these people are ungrateful because the gratefulness of your wealth is shown by spending it in the way of allah and when you do not spend it there you are showing ungratefulness verse 277 those who believe and do good deeds establish regular prayers and give regular charity will have their reward with their rub they will have nothing to fear or to regret now we find that the prohibition of riba came at the end of the revelations probably because it is very hard to get yourself free from this evil and until and unless you have fear of allah within your heart you just cannot free yourself from it and for the reason this very reason these people are those who establish sala perfectly and pay their due zakat because these two acts are also governed by the fear of allah and these people have nothing to fear because they have their total trust in allah subhanahu wa taala and thus allah is their protector and they have nothing to regret this means that people who do not obey allah in dunya will regret it in the akhirah that we wish that we are given one more chance and then we will obey but their time would be up but these people the ones mentioned in the verse who pray regularly and give sadaka regularly these people have none of such regrets verse 278 O you who believe fear Allah and weigh what is still due to you from usury if you are indeed believers now the historical background of this verse is that before the prohibition of riba riba was very very common in arabia and there were two tribes banu tahakif and banu makhzum the two tribes had mutual riba dealings with each other now uh, banu makhzum became muslim and now when the revelations about the unlawfulness of riba had come they thought to be impermissible to pay back the amounts of riba due to which was due to the other tribe and on the other hand the other tribe banu tahakhif started demanding and pressurizing for their claim and the people of banu makhzum explained to them that now they had entered the fold of islam and they had no intention of spending their halal islamic earnings in paying of riba and this dispute rose in makka that was a time after the conquest of makka and hazrat muaz was the governor of makka at that time appointed by prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and hazrat muaz reported this incidents in writing to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and requested for uh, his guidance over it and it was then that this verse was revealed and the gist of which is that all previous dealings involving riba should be cancelled after entering the fold of islam and no previous riba amount should be considered now and at this 
time of Hajjat al-Wida, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam discussed this issue in detail in his famous sermon. Now everyone will take back their actual amount, but no increase will be taken from any side. In this way, no one will be harmed. And the first riba that was rendered was by. Uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself when he announced that the riba of hazrat abbas ibn mutlib he was the uncle of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam large amounts of money were were due to non muslims in the form of riba to him at the end of the verse again the warning that fear allah because only the fear of allah can stop you from evil laws alone cannot be enough and look at the words of the quran that you will have to leave riba if you are a believer verse 279 or war shall be declared against you by allah and his rasul if you repent you may return your principal causing no loss to the debtor and suffering no loss now here we see one of the most frightening verses of the quran and one literally shudders if you can comprehend it really it says that or war shall be declared against you by allah and his rasul we see that such intensity severity is not shown anywhere else in the quran for any sin may it be kufr or shirk even and if we hear of a war between our country and another we are struck by panic and fear where our opponents are human beings like us they are our own species yet we fear them so much and just imagine waging a war against allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam can anyone even think of being at war with allah rabbul izzat and look at people who are swaying and weeping by listening to the nats of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but they have not given up interest so what's the use of all this swaying and crying where in reality they are at war with him sallallahu alaihi wasallam the verse ends by saying that if you repent you may return your principal causing no loss to debtor and suffering no loss now from this verse we find certain rulings and that is that taking riba is one of the sins for which sincere tauba has to be made and if tauba is made and with the resolution that the person will not involve him involve himself in riba again only in that case his principal amount will be returned according to the islamic sharia and if tauba was not done but riba was given up then receiving of his capital amount will no more be valid for example take the case of a person who uh, just does not believe that riba could be haram therefore he does not repent but makes a resolution that he will have nothing to do with riba anymore then this person goes out of the fold of islam and becomes a murtad and the injunctions governing a murtad are that his belongings go out of his possession that which he earned during the period when he was a muslim goes to his muslim inheritors and that which he has earned after his involvement with kufr goes to the baitul mal that is why this non repenter who considers riba to be halal will not get his principal amount and in case of a person who considers riba as haram but still he is involved in riba then he is a rebel his belongings too are confiscated and placed as a trust in the baitul mal so that it could be given back to him when he repents perhaps it is to point out such details that it is said in the verse that if you do not repent even your principal will be held back 
verse 280 if the debtor is in a difficulty grant him time till it is easy for him to repay but if you waive the sum by way of charity it will be better for you if you understand it now here in this verse we see that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the always all merciful shows us a way which is totally in contrast with the riba consumer that if you find that the one who has taken loan is poor and cannot pay back immediately so you should extend his time limit and it says in a hadith the gist of which is that the days you increase the limit for the person who has taken a loan you are given a reward of sadaqa every day equivalent to the money that person has borrowed for example if a person borrowed 10000 rupees from you and he was supposed to uh, return this 10000 in a period of one month it was settled between you and you and him that he is going to return in one month but he couldn't and you increase the limit of return to two months then you will get a reward of 10000 sadaqa every day for one month which you extended for him and if you forgive some of it it will be better for you how will it be better that this will be counted as charity on your behalf and your wealth will be blessed by barakah because of it according to a hadith of the brani a person who wishes to be under the shade of divine mercy when there will be no other shade for anyone to hide under he should treat the poor borrower with lenience or forgive him the debt if it comes to that and another hadith says that a person who wishes that his prayer be answered or his misfortune be removed he should give respite to the penniless in debt verse 281 fear the day when you shall return to allah when everyone shall be paid in full what they have earned Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas says that this verse is the last in order of its revelation. No other verse was revealed after that. 31 days later, the Prophet ﷺ died and the command is that fear, accountability, its rewards and punishments. And this command follows right after the instruction of riba. Verse 282, O believers, when you deal with each other in lending for a fixed time, Put it in writing. Let a scribe write it down with justice between the parties. The scribe who is given the gift of literacy by Allah should not refuse to write. He is under obligation to write. Let him who incurs the liability dictate fearing Allah, his Rabb, and not diminishing anything from the settlement. If the borrower, borrower is mentally unsound or weak or is unable to dictate himself, let the guardian of his interest dictate for him with justice. Let two witnesses from among you bear witness to all such documents. If two men cannot be found, then one man and two women of your choice should bear witness so that if one of the women forgets anything, the other may remind her. The witness must not refuse when they are called upon to do so. You must not be averse to writing for a future period whether it is a small matter or big this action is more just for you in the sight of allah because it facilitates the establishment of evidence and is the best way to remove all doubts but but if it is a common commercial transaction concluded on the spot among yourselves there is no blame on you if you do not put it Put in writing, you should have witness when you make commercial transactions. Let no harm be done to the scribe or witness. And if you do so, you shall be guilty of transgression. Fear Allah. It is Allah that teaches you and Allah has knowledge of everything. Now this verse is the longest verse of the Holy Quran and it is known as Ayte Dain. In the previous verse we read, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids usury and interest and encourages charity. So if we have riba, then charity is the only way out for the poor and needy people to make both ends meet. But we also find that there are people who cannot give charity and there are people who do not take charity. So the solution for these people is that they take loan. So loan is declared halal, but 
as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us etiquettes and regulations of every kind of ibadah and every kind of halal deed, he has given us rules for a loan as well. Why? Because the initial stage, uh, it happens in the initial stage of loan that people trust each other, but later they forget the terms and conditions and then relationships become spoiled. So in order to avoid that, special care has been taken. All these instructions are in the category of mustahab. The believer uh, sorry, the believer starts by saying, O oh, believers, when you deal with each other in lending for a fixed period of time, put in writing. Now, the instruction is that whenever loan is taken, it should be written down. Now, who will write it? The verse gives us the instruction. Let a scribe write it down with justice between the parties. Now, from this sentence, we know that the scribe has to be just and neutral he should not be favoring any one party in the next sentence the scribe is given instructions he himself is given instructions that the scribe who is given the gift of literacy by allah should not refuse to write he is under obligation to write so the instruction is that the person who is asked to write should not refuse. We should see this instruction of the Quran by keeping in view all kinds of people and not by just applying it to ourselves alone because we see that there are many people there are many places, like in the rural areas, there are a few people who know how to read and write properly. So if these people start refusing, then there would be no one to write. Then who will dictate? The verse tells us. Let him who incurs the liability dictates, fearing Allah his Rabb and not diminishing anything from the settlement. So this means that the person who is taking the loan will have the right to dictate. Why? Because he is the weak one and he can be wronged very easily. But he too is warned that he should fear Allah and should not dictate anything that is not true. Then the verse says that if the borrower is mentally unsound or weak or is unable to dictate himself, let the guardian of his interest dictate for him with justice. Now, this is another situation that sometimes it happens that the one who is taking the loan is low in IQ or he is physically unfit. Then on his behalf, his guardian will dictate, but the right to dictate still remains with the same party. Which party? The party who is borrowing. The verse then says that let two witnesses from among you bear witness to all such documents. If two men cannot be found, then one man and two women of your choice will be a witness. So that if one of the women forgets anything, the other may remind her. Now this means that two witnesses should be arranged on the spot and they should be two Muslim men, especially if the document is not written. And if two men are not present, then one man and two women. And another condition is that the witnesses should be approved by both the parties, not that just one is approving them. This is one of the verses which is commonly taken up by the enemies of Islam to create hatred in people. Uh, in people's heart for Islam. And the objection is that why one man and two women as witness? Now, in answering this objection, the first point is that two women will not give testimony. Only one will give it and the other will just be there for her support, her emotional support and correct her when she forgets. Imagine your own self in such a position that you are standing in a gathering of 20 or 30 men. Would you prefer that you are standing there alone amongst them or another woman is standing by your side to support you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this second woman is there to remind her of what she forgets. Now it has been proved that women are forgetful when especially before and during the menstrual cycle during pregnancy 
and while feeding a baby because of the hormonal changes she is undergoing so this is for her help then we see that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given different jobs and different roles to men and women to men and women and has given them different emotional and physical capabilities to fill their respective role and a woman's priority and job is her home her children her husband and she has been saved from the burdens and responsibilities which exist outside her home that is why she is not asked to pray five times in a mosque she is not required to go for juma prayers but if she wants to go she should not be stopped she is not asked to go for jihad and she is saved from the responsibility of earning and this is not her job and similarly she is not given this burden of bearing the testimony The meaning of this phrase is taken as its exact opposite and in other words we claim that why aren't we given the responsibility and burden of testimony instead of being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has saved us from this mess and giving testimony is not considered to be a blessing of Allah of which we have been deprived of and in case Uh, in cases which are a woman's department testimony for a woman is taken for example in cases of razat <clears throat> that is breastfeeding and nasab that whose child it is is only taken from one woman and even if 10 men come to give testimony against her it won't be accepted whereas in the department of men that is business or trading the testimony is taken from men and also in the cases of crime and murder because being a witness to such cases frightens the bravest of men even and we see that women are emotional and being emotional is their requirement allah has made them that way because if she does not possess these emotions she cannot upbring her children so her testimony will be ruled by emotion for example if she comes to know that Uh, if she would tell the truth that would mean chopping off someone's hand she might hide the truth due to her emotional weakness so these people who raise objections on this verse should be asked that is giving testimony a right or a burden <clears throat> the verse then says the witness must not refuse when they are called upon to do so you must not be averse to writing for a future period whether it is a small matter or big this action is more just for you in the sight of allah because it facilitates the establishment of evidence and is the best way to remove all doubt now this whole phrase means that when the uh, <clears throat> witnesses are called for witness they should not refuse and everything should be written till the last detail for example if you are taking from someone 3 lakh and 10000 and 50 rupees one should not round it off the figure and say that you know i am taking 3 lakh rupees the 10000 and 50 rupees even should be written as well and the date and time of return should be written and the date and time when it is being taken should also be written So Allah likes it this way because this way doubts and misunderstandings do not rise. Then the verse says but if it is a common commercial transaction concluded on the spot among yourselves there is no blame on you if you do not put in writing. Now this means that everyday com- commitments like you know we buy commodities by giving money on the spot and purchasing something this does not need the requirement of writing but the verse says you should have witness when you make commercial transactions what does this mean this means that when big transactions are made then witnesses and writing both are required the verse then goes on to say let no harm be done to the scribe or witness and if you do so you shall be guilty of transgression fear allah it is allah who teaches you and allah is the knower of everything this passage means that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected the witness and the one who writes the transaction that is the scribe allah warns that do not harm them 
Now, how can you harm them? They can be harmed in two ways. Number one, any of the party threatens them or pressurizes them to write or to say something which is not true. And number two, these people have come out of the way to help you and maybe they have left important jobs and businesses behind. So their time should not be wasted and they should be paid for it. For example, you have asked a person to come as a witness from another city and you don't bother to ask him uh, where he is staying or where he is eating from and you don't pay for his ticket and obviously he might be feeling shy to ask you so all these things come under harming the scribe or the witness verse 283 then the verse says uh, sorry it uh, was verse 283 says if you are on a journey and cannot find a scribe to write down the transaction then transact your business by taking possession of a pledge if one of you entrust another with the pledge let the trustee deliver the pledge a pledged property to its owner and let him fear Allah his Rabb. Do not conceal testimony and whoever conceals it, his heart is surely sinful. Allah is aware of all your actions. Now, this verse says that if you are on a journey and cannot find a scribe to write down the transaction, then transact your business by taking possession of a pledge. Now, what does this mean? This means that if you are on a journey and one needs a loan. You cannot find anyone to write it for you. Then you can give any of your belongings as a security to the person who is giving loan. He will keep this until you return back his money. And although in the Quran it says that you can borrow by this method, which is called girvi, during the time you are on a journey, but you can also use this method when you are not on a journey. And this is proved by authentic ahadith. Hazrat Anas Anu says that when the Prophet وسلم, died, his armor, what we call zarra, was kept as girvi on security with a Jew from whom the Prophet وسلم, had taken three wasak that is a mayor of grain for his family now we have certain rulings for these kinds of transactions the object which is placed as security is called uh, muratan sorry it is called murtahan murtahan now this murtahan is an amana of the person who has borrowed the money lying with the lender of money now the lender of money can use this object for example a person has given a goat as girvi now the lender of money can drink its milk but if he decides that he will sell its milk then after cutting his expenses of the fodder or anything he has spent on it the money will go to the borrower any profit that is derived from the object of girvi will go to the borrower and not to the lender. And if there is a loss, even then the borrower will bear the loss. So profit and loss both will go to the borrower. But if it was predecided that if the borrower does not return money till such and such date, then this object will belong to the lender. In that case, the lender is going to own it. Now, the verse then says that if one of you entrust another with a pledge, let the trustee deliver the pledge, pledged property to its owner. Now, this phrase is a bit tricky and by it, we also come to know that the writing down and the presence of witness during a transaction do not come under the category of farz. That if you trust each other, you can do verbal transactions. Now, if a person has lended you money and he has entrusted you, he has no written evidence or witness, you should return his loan back on the appointed time and do not make him suffer. And the verse says that let him fear Allah, his rab, meaning that he sh should fear Allah and does not bother or put into trouble the person who has been so kind to him to lend him the money in his hour of need. And this is the beauty of Islam, that ibadah is not just salah, it's not just fasting, 
it is also these small dealings in everyday life and to the minutest detail we have instructions about every situation then the end of the verse says do not conceal testimony and whoever conceals it his heart is surely sinful allah is aware of all your actions now this shows that like the tongue and the eyes and the ears sometimes your heart can be sinful there are some sins which are sins of the heart these are uh, these are you know uh, sins which are which no one else can see but they are in your heart and one of the sins of the heart is hiding testimony which is specially mentioned here because the correct judgment of any case depends on what the witness and if the witnesses hide testimony then they cannot be decided correctly now we see that in this verse allah subhanahu wa taala has given us legal instructions and technicalities and the base of all these things is what your heart because unless and until your heart is not set right you cannot benefit from any law akhiru dawana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alamin